and uh, we have two more points or um, topics to go through before the last points. I think that we we just go through that now, and then we'll have a break, and then we'll start with the with the assignment. I'll just leave that to you because uh, it's a way to get you to think about these different reasons for volunteering on your own uh, behalf. And Oscar already covered some volunteer and some, we can't call it motivation, we shouldn't, but reasons uh, for these uh, recurring event volunteers at different stadiums. As he said, most research has been conducted on these event volunteers. There are many groups that are so-called event groups, ev event research groups, that looks at these big events and uh, looks at the motivations or the reasons for these volunteers. And one of those studies you have on your, on your reading list, it's conducted by uh, some researchers from um, Anyho and um, areas around Oslo. And they looked at the um, 2011 uh, Nordic Ski Championship and volunteers there. And that's obviously a mega sport event, a big sport event. And they ask if we see a change in volunteer culture. As Oscar said, the ones on the stadiums, uh, they are there for the club. They have a strong identity, a strong network within the club. This builds their social capital, being part of this network. It might be a, di a bit different for these event volunteers. The reasons for volunteering are uh, of course, diverse, as he said. There are different reasons. There is not one reason why they volunteer. But uh, it might have changed a little bit. And they, di they divide between what they call the co uh, collective volunteer culture and the reflexive volunteer culture. The collective volunteer culture is much like the ones you see at the stadiums. They love the sports. In this case, they they like skis and they're interested in skis and ski uh, organization of, of skiing events. They have their Id identity there. They are, as also this other show, that they're mostly men and they're mostly older men. Not old, old, but uh, like in their 50s and 60s, uh, my, the majority. They are well educated and have good jobs, high income. And although, all, uh, despite that they, or not despite, of course, but um, they still volunteer a lot. So th there's this grouping of volunteers that, uh, the collective volunteers that are higher educated, mostly men, and um, with good income, generally speaking. Of course, not all of them are. But these we can, we can group as the collective volunteer. And then they have the reflexive volunteer. And these are the new volunteers, the ones that haven't volunteered before or volunteered a long time ago, but uh, have come back volunteering. And these guys found that the reflective volunteers are often younger, and they are more often women. And, um, and they are, and they are uh, <coughs> there for other reasons. They don't necessarily... Uh, have their heart in ski. Sometimes they do, but skiing and the interest in skiing is not necessarily the only reason for volunteering or the, m the most important reasons for volunteering. They are different. And they explain that with late modern time, sign modernitet. We are different than we used to be. There are different reasons for us doing what we used to be. And if we relate this to social capital, um, we, can, we can maybe Putnam would say, understand this change. Um, okay, I already said this. The younger, the women with lower incomes, they are, they are more represented than these first timers of the reflexive volunteers. And these two cultures, they're both there at the major, major sport event. And they are working together. Some of them, um, he talked about, he gave an example, Oscar, about leaders and, and um, uh, bosses in an event. 
very often the first timers might be hired as, as leaders of uh, a committee, for instance. Um, so the hierarchy are not, uh, it's not necessarily the one over the other. Uh, the hierarchy in a sporting event is often different from what it would be in regular life. But they coexist, co and they're both important groups, they argue. The basic motive is having fun and meeting other people and helping others. So there is a social thing, the individual thing. We want to have fun. Yeah, uh, there's a, a skiing event, a big skiing event in Holmegården. Of course, we want to be there, and we can help. But the first-timers also give this statement. They don't use the word social capital, of course, because that is not necessarily a word that we use all the time <laughs> in our everyday language. But um, it's a way to, to network. It's a way to get to know other people higher up in the sporting hierarchy. Um, and this might be an important uh, reason for them. To, um, uh, to increase your networks and increase your social capital. And that's why these people ask, has volunteering, not all volunteering, but has this new late modern type of volunteering become a self-development project? How many of you wrote uh, that it's good for my CV or similar in your, uh, in your notes? Why do you volunteer? It's not, it's not wrong to write that, but it's, it's, uh, it's very, um, what do you say, representative for this reflexive late modern volunteers, they would argue. Uh, to do something also because of your own development. Of course, we understand that. But that is quite different from these other groups of volunteers, as Oscar said, they don't use this on their CV. They, no, it's not relevant to be on the stadium and, and sell hot dogs. It's not relevant. I don't really write CVs anymore because I already have a stable job. But these guys, the reflexive volunteers, use this as a way of networking and as a way of building their resume or whatever. And then it doesn't matter uh, whether or not they like sports. Um, because that's not a part of this, necessarily. The social capital is just as important. And I, uh, I also <coughs> notice uh, when, when we um, recruit volunteers today, um, we also did that on the, on the, when they were here from the Idrets Sports County, or <laughs> Idrettskretsen, when Karsten was here talking about the youth groups and youth networks, that CV uh, argument, this is good on your resume, that is what you probably hear. Involve yourself, it's good for the resume. You're uh, uh, not late, but uh, coming employers, they're looking for your engagement rather than your grades. Yeah? You heard that before? It's better if you volunteer spend your time volunteering, spend another, an extra year doing your bachelor thesis. If you've done volunteer work, that's so important. And it is. It is. But then this whole um, nature of volunteering is slowly changing. You still earn your social capital, of course, but it's just turning. Yes, now to the next jumping from one t uh, thing to the other. I told Oscar now, if I was to do this again, I think I would have had one lecture with this whole volunteer social capital thing, and then another lecture with the managing volunteer sport organization, because that is, of course, very relevant for you guys. Um, and now we will just briefly touch, touch this uh, area. But um, that is how it is <laughs> this year. Um, as I've said many times, one of the major challenges for these voluntary sports organizations are, and not only sports organizations, voluntary organizations, are to 
recruit volunteers. Why, why do we volunteers in a, in a, a volunteer in a football club, for instance? Well, Oscar have some from this event volunteers. We have, we have uh, earlier now, I showed the research from the mega sport event volunteers, but in the everyday life of a running a sport club, that's a major issue. Parents, for instance, okay, your children are playing handball on the local handball team. I need you to sell cakes or lottery. Uh, so you don't really do it for the club, you do it for your child in order to give her or him this opportunity. Or someone was asking, someone was asking uh, last time about this uh, um, artificial grass on uh, Treffhuse uh, to do all this graveling and all this uh, work on the grass to, to improve the standards of it. Well, if, if a group were to do this, they do it for the ones that are playing, or you do it for yourself. Um, that's on the side, but anyway. But this uh, in, uh, recruiting volunteers is very prob problematic or challenging because you can't really demand anything. You have to ask very nicely or gently propose that maybe you should, uh, could, you, could you be on the, the calling list for the cake uh, baking, please? And then you have the power to say, no, I can't. That happens. So what do you do? Uh, and Österlund is Danish, and he uh, published this article. Some points that, of course, it varies between organizations, etc. but there are some points that are uh, maybe not crucial, but might be uh, worth considering in order to recruit these volunteers. We won't go through this because we've done that already, but this is a, the characteristic of a volunteer support organization. The first thing is to involve the members in major decisions. We know that the sports organization, the voluntary sports organizations are democratic. And then it's important, the first and second here, to delegate decision making and tasks across multiple committees and individuals. These two are connected. And one very important task for a manager in a sport club, maybe you are the only paid a manager or on the paid um, employee in your club as a, a yeah, manager, a daily leader in a club. You need people. So the, you, you are, of course, tempted just to make all the decisions because I know what's best and I could just do this and this and that and then everything will be easy. If people then are told that I've decided that we do it this way and that went this way with that tournament, doesn't necessarily work. The organization members must be involved and feel, and, and that's, it's kind of an easy logic, to feel ownership to something makes you want to work with it. On the side, I've been, um, my research has been on uh, the Norwegian Confederations of Sports development projects in Africa in the 1980s. And there was one thing that NIF did that made the, c the project, I won't say that it was unsuccessful, but not as successful as it could be. And that was because they had a concept. They had the idea. You've learned about the Norwegian model. So we have the Norwegian model, and we just take it to Tanzania, and we try to implement it. And then the Tanzanians said, hey, sport for all, it's not really a concept. In, our, in, this, in this place. We're talking 1982. We don't really involve children and women. They, they are not. Okay, children can play sports, but women, they're not sports people. Yeah, but we have this concept, so this is what we're gonna do, and we have the money to do this. Okay. Second, uh, uh, you should do, um, or uh, it's enough with that example. That's, that's the whole concept we tried to implement somewhere. And obviously, um, there was no feeling of ownership on the other side because it wasn't theirs. There was a Norwegian project in Tanzania. It wasn't a Tanzanian project in Tanzania. And that's it's the same, it's relevant here. If you have made all the decisions and if you have 
one way to do it and just do what I, what I planned. It's difficult to create this kind of ownership. And if you don't have ownership to something, you don't have an interest of sustaining it. There's no reason why I should work my ass off for some, something that I haven't really been part of. I don't care about it. So these two, important for you that are going to be managers. Second, and that's also, OK, are you a volunteer if you work for a Team Jersey? Yes, of course you're a volunteer. But volunteer work is like freely given time for a certain activity. Yes, it is. But this recognizing volunteers by giving them perks, material incentives, are important. Or it could be important. OK, if you volunteer here, we will give you a Team Jersey. Or you will get a season ticket. And the second season ticket, half price. OK then I might consider it. Those kind of things. And, and then, but then there is this, because there is this idea that all volunteer work should be of free will and it should be so idealistic. And if you give everyone a free jersey, then it obviously costs money. And does it cost more than it, we say in Norwegian, we say, does it cost <laughs> more than it tastes? I feel like that's Peter Schulberg language. But um, if, it's, um, if it's worth the amount you put into it. But that is one thing that he found. Recognize their efforts by granting them something. I know they do that at, uh, I have this here, at the, um, at Aker Stadion, for um, Stadion Svenne, the friends of the stadium. These are the volunteers that Oscar looked at. And where did I say? For instance, here. Right, so you got a nice, positive, and engaging environment. Yeah, you network with people, you get a club uh, jersey, season ticket, a little bit of money, no, um, food, etc., etc., and parties. That's very important for some. Actually, people say that this was one of the best things of being a volunteer, a social gathering. And that is uh, in line with what he found was important in order to recruit these volunteers. This is, of course, a difficult thing. How do we s formulate a strategy of recruiting volunteers? How do we, because we don't know if the strategy is good or not, or it will recruit the volunteer. But it's about testing different strategies, finding out how do we do it. And then the last thing that is more and more relevant, I think, and also in the line of what we talked about, to use electronic modes, as you say, or electronic communication groups on Facebook or Twitter accounts or whatever in order to recruit these volunteers. And of course, if you can tempt with these perks, then uh, it's, um, it's an, uh, a benefit for you. So that was briefly those five points that might recruit volunteers. As I said, we could talk about this forever, but we won't. Do you have any comments? Does this sound reasonable? Are there any other things that you would uh, suggest to be done? You that are volunteers, how were you recruited in a sense? Through family, friends, Facebook, meetings, being members of clubs? Do you feel you have to do it? Those are the kind of things that we would, would want to know if we were to know about people um, volunteering. Um, do you have children involved, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And now we're getting to the end of uh, the presentation, on, and we're actually on time. That's brilliant. I just want you first to see this. Next lecture, we're supposed to be about professionalization in sports, but that lecture has been changed, not changed, but uh, delayed <laughs> until the last, that will be the last lecture. Um, so next time it's about sport for all, perspectives on children and youth. And then this professionalization, I just got it confirmed, we'll have a um, visitor coming um, from Tadja uh, Nordstrand Jakobsen from MFK. He will come and talk about the professionalization of MFK as a football club. And uh, he could come at <laughs> the last lecture. So we'll just skip that or forward that.
So, and also what you have to read then is different from what was on the original plan. I'll present uh, the assignment to you now. And this is, is um, the reasons why, first of all, we were on this, um, this uh, meeting on Wednesday. Um, Wendell was there and uh, Ingvill as well about uh, the study barometer. I, I think you've seen those um, numbers. Sport management doesn't really come out very great. And one thing that uh, was um, mentioned is uh, also both relevant assignments, connection to research. Not ne it was on not only for sport, for sport management, it was for the, the whole, the whole, um, all, all, what do you say? all subjects here. But that could be uh, not um, desire, <laughs> searching for the words, but encouraged to use more of those kind of things. And also demanding, not demanding as I demand you to do something, but to give more, uh, more uh, chances to work more with the, the, um, the different topics that you have. Because to be honest, uh, most students, at least from that uh, uh, specific um, survey, don't really spend that much time working uh, on their, on their um, things. <laughs> things. Uh, so this is um, what I wanted, want you to do, is to make groups of two, Three, you can you you're free to, to decide yourselves, the large the size of the group. But and also because I know that you that are doing bachelor thesis now, you have um, you are doing the methodology course. So this is relevant for you, as well. I want you to develop a questionnaire, or an interview. You've already learned probably about the semi-structured interviews. Um, I want you to develop that with the research question. Why do you volunteer? Oscar touched upon it now. Maybe it's not accurate to ask somebody about motivation and just give a scale, one to seven. Uh, I told, uh, I gave feedback here. Maybe to ask about somebody's feelings is not accurate in a questionnaire. So try to be specific. And this is, um, I know that you have a home exam now as well. So if you. This is definitely relevant if you want to, if you're making questionnaires. If you make a questionnaire, you try to find out what people think about something. It's always smart to ask the same question in a different way so that you see that it's consistent. You learned that already? No? <laughs> okay, so when you've developed this questionnaire, I want you to interview if, if four people using this questionnaire. And I must, must say, it's not supposed to be like huge. Just a little thing covering what <coughs> you consider are the, re or the good questions to find out why people volunteer. Use four people, your family, brothers, sisters, classmates, whoever. And then you make a small analysis of these results. This is a small research project. Um, if you want feedback on your result, not the result <coughs> as such, but how you worked with it. It sounds very strict. I'll give you 10 minutes, but <laughs> it's because I'll give you, uh, uh, I will give you feedback on this if you want feedback. So just uh, try to develop a little research question, do the interviews, and then um, try to make a small analysis using what we've talked about today. What does that say about volunteerism? How can we explain this? Do you have any questions? In Norwegian, if you need. From the letter? No. You don't have to deliver it to me. If you do, um, no, it's because it's, uh, it's um, I encourage you to work with it because I think you can learn something from it. I wouldn't do it if, you didn't, if I didn't think that you would learn from it. But I'm not, um, I, and I'm also encouraging you to get feedback on it. 
And if you don't do the entire assignment and you want uh, and you spend time developing this questionnaire, developing questions, etc., and you want feedback on that, it's okay. Okay? Uh, so I'll give you time to work on that now. And I will be around. And then uh, if you can use this in your methodology somehow, and if there's another way that you could, um, that you see that you could use it for your home exam, for instance, that's fine with me too. Any other questions? I would let you hand it in, but it's uh, not a part of what you, um, and of course, if you want to, I will gladly give you feedback, but since it's not a part of the, um, what do we call it, the original plan, I can't do that. I can't say that you have to do this. And since you also have um, um, that you need to do. Okay? But I'm around for questions. You can have a break now if you want and then come back, or you can work with it and then 